This week on Vatican Connections, Pope Francis has great expectations for his pilgrimage to Fatima, new recruits are sworn into the Vatican army, and the Holy Father ordains new priests for the Diocese of Rome. Hello and welcome to Vatican Connections. I'm Emily Callan. Pope Francis is spending two days in Portugal this week to pray at the Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima for the 100th anniversary of the Marian apparitions to three shepherd children. It is his first visit to the country and the Shrine in Fatima is one of the largest Marian shrines in the world after the shrines dedicated to Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico, Aparecida in Brazil and Lourdes in France. With the Pope's visit, the sanctuary is expecting between 800,000 and 1 million pilgrims. More than just a typical apostolic trip, the Holy Father is going to Fatima on an apostolic pilgrimage. This is a Marian pilgrimage happening in the month of May, the Vatican spokesperson explained in a press briefing. And it isn't the first time a Pope visits the shrine. Fifty years ago, Pope Paul VI went, and so did his other successors, John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Calling to mind the theme of his pilgrimage with Mary, a pilgrim in hope and in peace, Pope Francis said in a video message to the people of Portugal, it is as the universal pastor of the church that I would like to come before the Madonna and to offer her a bouquet of the most beautiful blossoms that Jesus entrusted to my care. He sent this message on the eve of his trip to Fatima and here is a clip from that message. Querido povo português, Faltam poucos dias para minha e vossa peregrinação até junto de Nossa Senhora de Fátima, vivendo hoje em feliz expectativa do nosso encontro na Casa da Mar. Bem sei que me queris também nas vossas casas e comunidades, nas vossas aldeias e cidades. O convite chegou-me. Escusado será dizer que gostaria de o aceitar, mas não é possível. Desde já agradeço a compreensão com que as diversas autoridades acolheram a minha decisão de circunscrever a visita aos momentos e atos próprios da peregrinação no santuário de Fátima, marcando encontro com todos aos pés da Virgem Mãe. Formando-nos um só coração e um só alma, entregar você e todos a Nossa Senhora, pedindo-lhe para segredar a cada um o meu Imaculado Coração, será o teu refúgio e o caminho que te conduzirá até Deus. Com Maria, peregrino na esperança e na paz. Assim reza o lema de, desta nossa peregrinação, sendo todo ele um programa de conversão. Para esse momento abençoado, que culmina um centenário de momentos abençoados, alegra-me saber que vos estáis a preparar com intensa oração. Esta alarga o nosso coração e prepara-o para receber os dons de Deus. Agradeço a vos as orações e sacrifícios que diariamente ofereceis por mim, é de muito preciso, pois sou um pecador entre pecadores, um homem de lábios impuros que habita no meio de um povo de lábios impuros. A oração ilumina os, os meus olhos para saber olhar os outros como Deus os vê, para amar os outros 
como Él os ama. No se unome, veño a te vos na alegría de partillar con vos o evangelio da esperanza y da paz. O Señor os abençoe y a Virgen Mael vos protege. During his general audience in St. Peter's Square last Wednesday, the Holy Father delivered his traditional weekly catechesis and he focused on the figure of Mary, who is a model of Christian hope. And in light of his upcoming pilgrimage to Fatima, he explained that Mary teaches us the virtue of waiting, even when everything appears nonsensical. Here is a clip from his catechesis. Non dimenticatevi che c'è sempre un grande rapporto fra la speranza e l'ascolto. E Maria è una donna che ascolta, che accoglie l'esistenza come essa si consegna a noi con i suoi giorni felici, ma anche con le sue tragedie che mai vorremmo avere incrociato. Fino alla notte suprema di Maria, quando il figlio è inchiodato al legno della croce. Le madri non tradiscono e in quell'istante, ai piedi della croce, nessuno di noi può dire quale sia stata la passione più crudele se quella di un uomo innocente che muore sul patibolo della croce o l'agonia di una madre che accompagna gli ultimi istanti della vita del suo figlio. I Vangeli soltanto dicono lei stava. Stava lì nel più brutto momento, nel crudele momento. E soffriva col figlio, stava. Le sofferenze delle madri. E tutti noi abbiamo conosciute donne forti che hanno portato avanti tante sofferenze dei figli. Per questo tutti noi la amiamo come madre, non siamo orfani, abbiamo una madre in cielo, è la Santa Madre di Dio. Finally, before we move on to our regular headlines of the week, Cardinal Pietro Perlin, Vatican Secretary of State, was interviewed by Vatican Magazine on the Pope's trip to Fatima. After 100 years since the apparitions, we might wonder how an event which happened so long ago and in a very particular context would still resonate now. How then does Fatima speak to us today? Here was his answer. Uh, io credo che... Well, I think that Fatima's message is the message of Christianity, in particular right now, when we are living in this Easter season. It is the announcement that Christ has risen, that Christ is alive, and He is the Lord of history. There are still some speculations about the Fatima secrets. What Fatima wanted to tell us was clear. And it brought us back to the fundamental message of our Christian and Catholic faith. We also find another important message, that life is a pilgrimage towards Jesus. It is a pilgrimage supported by the strength of the gospel and renewed by it. Fatima's mission is clear. It is recalling the church to what it has to be and how it has to be in the future around the world. It is a community which proclaims a new earth 
and anticipates it, and through the course of history, even the most difficult and painful situations, it can transform this history. That is the prophetic message of Fatima and of the Church. We have to make the distinction between the means and the aim. Francesco and Jacinta are from a specific moment in history, which had a different way of expressing itself, had a different language. The characteristic of these two children was their simplicity in living the core message of the gospel. That is what they show us, and that the Immaculate Heart of Mary helps us to get to the heart of the gospel. Fatima stresses this aspect, that the Immaculate Heart of Mary is able to welcome fully the love and the mercy of God. This heart was able to live with the kind of freedom exemplified through the crucifixion. These children understood this, and the authority of their holiness is now recognized by the Church in front of the world. Twenty-nine Catholic bishops from the province of Quebec have been in Rome for their Ad Limina visit. They are the last group of Canadian bishops to do the trip and to meet the Pope. They haven't done so in 10 years and they're taking advantage of it. They already met with the Pope twice, once on May 5th for three hours, and their last one was on Thursday, a meeting which lasted two hours. They spoke about the secularization of Quebec, among other things, which the Holy Father did understand. He encouraged them to make evangelization a priority with the help of lay Catholics and to not be afraid of failure. Following their meeting, Archbishop Paul-André Durocher, Archbishop of Gatineau, told Catholic News Service that in Quebec, we are not about rebuilding what was there in the 40s and 50s. It was a style of church that is, as far as I'm concerned, he said, dead and does not need to be resurrected. What needs to be resurrected is faith in Jesus Christ. During their May 11th meeting, the bishops and the Pope also talked about the role of women in the church who should be included in decision making. The papal almoner was sent by Pope Francis to visit a gypsy family in Rome who just lost three daughters in a fire. They were four, eight, and 20 years old. Archbishop Konrad Krajewski has given them aid. The Halilovic family was staying in a camper when it caught fire in the night between May 9th and 10th. The rest of the family survived, both parents and eight other children. The police are investigating what could be an arson attack. In Rome, the Feast of Corpus Christi is being moved from Thursday to Sunday. The feast has been celebrated on Thursday since the 15th century and usually includes a candlelit procession led by the Pope from the Basilica of St. John Lateran to the Basilica of St. Mary Major. The feast is marked following the Feast of the Holy Trinity. And that decision was made for two reasons. First, to be aligned with the rest of the churches celebrating the feast on Sunday. And second, to make it accessible to as many faithful as possible. Corpus Christi falls on June 18th this year. Pope Francis will be leading the Eucharistic procession as usual, this time in the evening. Only 10 days after his apostolic trip to Egypt, Pope Francis sent a letter to Pope Tawardros II, Patriarch of the Coptic Orthodox Church. In his letter, dated May 10th, he thanked the Coptic Pope for his warm welcome, for having had the time to pray together and evoked the common declaration. He evoked, in particular, the fact that they have strengthened their baptismal unity in the body of Christ by declaring together that they, with one mind and heart, will seek sincerely not to repeat the baptism that has been administered in either of their churches for any person who wishes to join the other. 
he assured Pope Tawadros II of his continued prayers for peace in Egypt and in the Middle East. The letter marked the day of friendship between Coptic Orthodox and Catholics, a day established by Pope Tawadros II when he came back from his very first visit with Pope Francis in 2013. May 10th also recalls the historic meeting between Pope Paul VI and the previous Coptic Orthodox, Pope Shenouda III, in 1973. 35 leading experts in the world of science were in Rome for an international conference on contemporary cosmology. It took place in Rome at the Vatican Observatory and highlighted the work of a renowned cosmologist, Father Georges Lemaitre, who died 50 years ago. He was a priest belonging to the Fraternity of Friends of Jesus and considered one of the fathers of the Big Bang Theory. He also worked as the director of the Vatican Observatory in the 60s. The observatory's press release also stated that their main goal was to encourage faithful interaction among participants from both theoretical and observational cosmology and to explore the limits of modern cosmology and the scientific challenges of the near future. Did you know? The Feast of Corpus Christi was established by Pope Urban IV in 1264 with his bull Transiturus, the first universal feast sanctioned by a pope of the Latin Church. The opening words of the text are, About to pass from this world to the Father, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, since the time of his passion was at hand, instituted the great and wonderful sacrament of his body and blood, bestowing his body as food and his blood as drink. St. Thomas Aquinas helped Pope Urban IV write the bull and composed his Eucharistic hymn, Tantum Ergo, specifically for this feast. On the World Day of Prayer for Vocations at the Vatican, ten new priests were ordained by the Holy Father for the Diocese of Rome. This is something he does every year on that day, also called Good Shepherd Sunday. In his homily, in a very Pope Francis fashion, he broke from his prepared script to offer more pointed advice. Here's a summary of his homily. In being configured to Christ the eternal high priest and joined to the priesthood of the bishops, they will be consecrated as true priests of the New Testament, the Holy Father said, to preach the gospel, to shepherd God's people, and to celebrate the sacred liturgy, especially the Lord's sacrifice. Because of their authority, he urged them to believe what they read, that they teach what they believe, and practice what they preach. In other words, no to living a double life which is a disease in the church. And then he warned them about the homilies they will have to give. Their words must be nourishment for the heart. Do not give homilies that are too intellectual and elaborate, he told the new priests. Going back to the way they live their lives, Pope Francis insisted on the fact that by their ministry they are united to the sacrifice of Christ in the sacraments. Because of this, he urged them to imitate what they celebrate. To strive to put to death whatever in their members is sinful and to walk in newness of life, he added. Finally, the Pope asked them to be merciful and practice works of mercy. Again last weekend, 40 new recruits were received into the Pontifical Swiss Guards. They were sworn in in the San Damaso Courtyard at the Vatican. The ceremony was presided by Pope Francis, where the new guards swear to faithfully, loyally and honorably serve the Pope. To know what actually happened during this ceremony, Matteo Ciofi has more. The hot ceremony began on a Friday afternoon with Vespers at the Church of Santa Maria della Pietà in Campo Santo Teutonico, followed by the award of honor and the lay of the crown in commemoration of the fallen Swiss Guard nearly 500 years ago on May 6th. This event is held on this day every year for one reason. It's the anniversary of the sack of Rome which happened in 1527 by German mercenaries. It's also the day 147 Swiss Guard gave their life to protect the Pope. The Holy Father referred the sack of Rome in his speech to the new Swiss Guard on the day the guards, he said, distinguished themselves in courageous and indomitable defense of the Pope to the point of sacrificing their lives. 
Recalling that uh, sacrifice in the 16th century, he told them, today you are not called to this heroic offer of physical life, but to another, no less uh, arduous sacrifice, to serve the power of faith. This is a valid barrier for resisting the various forces and powers of this earth, and uh, above all, uh, he who is the prince of this world, the father of lies, who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour according to the words of the Apostle Peter. After uh, his speech, Pope Francis invited the young man to be always welcoming and patient in the service of the Vatican. The pilgrims and the tourists who have the chance to meet you are edified by discovery in you, he added, together with the characteristic of composure, precision, and professional seriousness, also generous Christian witness and holiness of life. Let this uh, be your first concern. The Swiss Guards have been at uh, the service of the Pope since the early 16th century. Their uh, patron are San Martin, San Sebastian, and San Nicholas of Lu. Their motto, Acriter et Fideliter, which means uh, with courage and loyalty. The commander of the Vatican Army, Christoph uh, Graf, was present at the ceremony and he introduced the 40 new guards to the Pope in the presence of the assistant to the Secretary of State, Monsignor Paolo Borgia. During the ceremony, the commander affirmed that his hope for the future was for Christians to always bravely raise their voice against injustice, following the Pope's example. The Pontifical Swiss Guard is one of the smallest armies in the world and one of the oldest still in operation. Its main responsibility is to protect the Pope and the Apostolic Palace. Although they have mostly held a ceremonial role, their training now includes unarmed combat and firearms. Not surprisingly, to become a Swiss Guard you must be Swiss, male, Catholic, in good health, have completed a two-year Swiss Army training and be between the ages of 19 and 30 years old. They are also typically unmarried. The fine uniform the Swiss Guards wear today was introduced by Jules Répon, commandant of the Pontifical Swiss Guard in the early 20th century. The official colors of the uniform are red, blue, orange, and yellow. The colors derive from the coat of arms of two noble families of Italy, the Della Rovere and the Medici. Répon kept the Renaissance style of the uniform, finding inspiration in paintings by the 16th century representations of the guards. Uniforms vary according to rank, but each one is tailor-made to the guardsmen. Fact, one uniform has 154 pieces and it weighs about 8 pounds. 32 hours are put into making it. The Swiss mercenaries played an important role in European politics in the Renaissance period. They were known as some of the best soldiers and were sought out by many European countries to help them in battle. An alliance between the Holy See and Switzerland began during the Italian wars in the 15th century. Swiss mercenaries were essentially used to fight the Pope's battles to defend what was then known as the Papal States from invasion. The founding date of the Pontifical Swiss Guard is set to 1506 when a group of 150 soldiers entered the Vatican. Eventually, Pope Julius II gave them the title of Defenders of the Church's Freedom. Today, Swiss Guards have security and honorary responsibilities. They include visitors' control, guard duty, and personal protection to the Pope and College of Cardinals. But on their spare time, some find leisure in various activities. The Swiss Guard has its own soccer team and music band. And that's all for our show this week. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send them via Vatican Connections Twitter page at Vati Connections. I'll be happy to answer them on our next episode. And if you are new to the show or a returning viewer, we at Salt and Light value your feedback on the content we produce. If you would like to tell us how we're doing, please visit saltandlighttv.org slash vcsurvey to send us your comments directly to the programming team. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you next week on a new episode of Vatican Connections.